Hey, it's Keisha here with Defending the Early Years podcast. We'll be focusing on amplifying the voices of early childhood educators, advocates, and all of those who love children. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Defending the Early Years podcast. Today, I have with me research professor, Peter, Dr. Peter Gray. Welcome, Peter. Hi, Lakeisha. I'm uh, very happy to be here. Yeah, I'm really happy to have you here because one thing that you talk a lot about um, and that we all as, as play people talk about is that word play, right? We talk about how important it is for young children. And um, sometimes we talk about what it looks like in our environments. But I think we need to talk more about what it means. I think we need to be sure first that we're talking about the same thing. So today with you, I would like to focus on that definition. What, what does play mean? What is play? Tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and that definition of play. Okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a research professor in the Department of uh, Psychology and Neuroscience at Boston College. I have... Um, for many years now been studying play uh, and how children learn through play and uh, other self-directed um, ventures. Um, I've uh, written a book called Free to Learn, which um, describes how um, children, it presents evidence that children can educate themselves um, if they're allowed to follow their natural drives to explore and to play and to socialize with other people, especially with other children over an age mixed range. So those are some of the things that I've done. I also uh, write a blog for Psychology Today uh, where I've posted now some bit over 200 essays that have to do with issues of um, of education and play and cur and curiosity and creativity and so on. So that's just a little bit about my background. So now you asked about the word play and, uh, and uh, the definition of it. So play, like a lot of words in English or in any other language, I suppose, um, can have a lot of different meanings. You know, we can use the word play you might use the word play in one context, or I might even use the word play in one context and mean something quite different from what I mean by the word play in another context. So, for example, we talk about professional sports teams playing <laughs> basketball or baseball or whatever. That, in my definition, is not play, and I'll make that clear as we go along. We talk about... Um, adult directed play where adults are um, telling children okay now we're all going to play this <laughs> and uh, by my definition that's also not play uh, so I want to make clear what I mean by play and I also want to make the point that this is not just me this is not an idiosyncratic definition of play that I've come up with I've come up with this definition of play by bringing together the definitions of play that scholars throughout many years have used when they have talked about play, play scholars, people who really study play. So when people are, the, the kinds of people who are scholars of play, who are researching play, who have written classic works on play, the question I raised when I tried to develop my own definition was, how did they define play? What is, it, what is this phenomenon that they found fascinating and that they were observing and writing about? So, uh, so that's kind of a prelude to my uh, explanation yeah. of my definition of play. Um, I also might say that I, before I even try to define play, I might also say that like many, many things, uh, especially many kinds of categories of behavior uh, or moods or dispositions and so on in psychology, it's not an all or none thing. Um, uh, what I'm going to describe is what I might call pure play, where all the characteristics that I describe are present, We, I would call it play, just plain play where some of the characteristics present, but not all of them, or they're not fully pleasant, present. I might call it a playful activity. An activity can be more or less playful. 
without being fully play by the definition that I'm going to give. Mm -hmm. So with all those caveats, <laughs> let me go ahead and uh, and uh, tell you. So I, I define as play an activity that has the following five characteristics. And now what I'm going to do is list those characteristics and expand on each one of them just a little bit. And I think in the expansion, what you will see is that the very de within the very definition of play lies an understanding of how play is useful to children's development. So the first characteristic of play, in my view, and in that of many other people who've studied play, is that it is self-chosen and self-directed. So if somebody else is making you do it, <laughs> or somebody else is putting you in a situation where you would be embarrassed not to do it, as in the case of a teacher standing in front of the classroom and saying, now children, we're all going to play this, <laughs> mm -hmm. then it's not play. If you've got a coach who's telling you what you're going to be doing and how you're going to be doing it and when you're going to be doing it and, and correcting you when you're doing it wrong, some kind of coach who's not a player himself or herself, but who is a director of the play, then it's not play because it's not self-chosen and it's not, and most more clearly it's not self-directed. So play is self-chosen and self-directed. Well, why is that a valuable part of the definition of play? It's because play is where children learn how to initiate their own activities. It's where they learn how to control their own activities, to direct their own activities. So that's the, um, that's the in, my, in my mind, that's the primary definition of play, self-chosen and self-directed, but it's not the only characteristic that's that's part of the definition. That's one of the big things for me um, in my program is it's really important for me to allow the children to come into a room that's not telling them what they have to do now, right? And that's organically it. make a decision. <laughs> that's exactly right. So they, mm -hmm. so it's their, you know, it's their decision what they want to do. And if they want to, you know, so that's the first part. And, and this is how, you know, one of the most important things that we have to learn as human beings is how to initiate activities, how to do things, how to get things started, you know, how to, and how to control ourselves as we're behaving without some authority figure standing over us and telling us all the time what to do. And the other part of this, this first point in the definition is, although I've said self-chosen and self-directed, at the same time, this isn't part of the definition, but this is simply a fact of play, of children's play. Children want to play with other children. Mm -hmm. So that means when I say self-chosen and self-directed, that self might be a group of kids. <laughs> you know, they're saying, let's say you and I are kids and we want to play together. And, um, and I want to play this, but you want to play that. What does that mean? We're going to have to, if, we, if we're going to play together, we're going to have to have a discussion about it. We're going to have to figure this out. We're going to have to find something that we both want to play, or we're going to have to compromise in some way. So when I say self-chosen and self-directed, I don't necessarily mean as an individual, but I mean that it could be a group of peers, people who are of equal status or at least roughly equal status, not somebody who is lording it over the other person who's making the decision. So we are, um, so, so one of the really important things that children are learning in play because it's self-chosen and self-directed and social is how to how to negotiate with your peers, yeah. how to compromise, how to decide. And how to express your ideas, how to say what you are thinking, right? And I'm glad you put it that way, how to express your ideas. You know, there's actually research showing that children's language, when they're playing with other children, is more complex and more sophisticated than when children are talking with adults. Not surprising in a way when you think about it, because when they're play, when they're talking to negotiate play, you know, I, 
you know, I'm telling you, you know, I'm, I want to be the, um, I want to be the, the troll under the bridge. <laughs> and, and I want to, and so I have to explain to you what I mean by the troll and what, what I'm, why I want to be the troll under the bridge. And you might say, well, I want to be the troll. You were the troll last time. So then we have some kind of a discussion about it. And, and it's a real discussion. You know, we really care about, it's an interesting thing. Even though this is make-believe and the children know it's make-believe, we care about it. We want to, you know, I, I want to be the troll or maybe I want to be the king. Maybe that's maybe a better choice for what I would want to be, <laughs> right? So, so, the, um, so, so children are really practicing language in play. You know, there's old research showing that it, unfortunately this doesn't happen so much today because there's um, less opportunity for it but there's old research that when a family immigrates to the united states and they don't speak english the kids learn english very quickly mm -hmm. and they learn yeah. english because they're playing with other kids yeah. and the other kids are all speaking english that they're playing with or most of them are so they pick up the english they I've it, experienced that have, have you? That. Yeah. Oh my goodness. We had a little boy come for uh, the summer, two summers in a row. And he, he, his parents spoke no English. Yeah. And by the end of the summer, not only was he speaking English, but the other kids had learned Spanish. So it was, oh, wow. it was fascinating <laughs> to see them teaching each other uh, language. Right. And it was through play. Like they had to figure out when he was screaming, mas, 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 they figured out, okay, that must mean more. Like he needs more. <laughs> so they, they figured it out together through play because they all right. wanted to keep that play going. Play is such a motivation for learning the language that that the that is being used in the play and for becoming more sophisticated in that language as you're going, because you've gotta you've gotta be able to express yourself in order to get what you want in play and in order to negotiate effectively. So you know, part of play and social play because it's self-chosen, self-directed and social is you have to be able to figure out how to get what you want in play, but also allow the other people to get what they want because if you don't, they're gonna quit, right? And yeah. then you're just gonna be left alone. There's a kind of natural consequence for not being willing to compromise and um, and um, and negotiate so you know think what important lessons already these are i mean would uh, how i wish that our yeah. people in congress knew how to how to negotiate you know maybe they didn't play enough or maybe they don't play enough now with uh, with one another to to know how to communicate with one another but this is an extraordinarily important thing that children are are learning when they are are um, are playing so so that's the first character self-chosen self-directed a second characteristic <clears throat> of play is that it um, it is done for its own sake. It's not done for some kind of reward outside of itself. Now, sometimes people say play doesn't have goals, but I don't think that's the right way to say it. You can in play have goals, you know. Mm -hmm. You, you, you might be playing a game where the goal is to make baskets and it could be basketball can be play. I'll explain the difference between when it's play and when it's not. Or the goal could be to, you know, if you're playing Candyland, which can be real play, the goal is to get to the end of the board to quote win. So play can have goals, but the goals are only valuable within the context of the game. This is the, the goal is what you're trying to accomplish. You're, you know, or even you're making a sandcastle on the beach. Your goal is to produce a beautiful sandcastle. But notice it's the production of the sandcastle. It's not the having of the sandcastle that matters. The sandcastle is just gonna be washed away anyway. So it's the creation of this beautiful thing. It is the process of scoring baskets if it's basketball. It's the process of playing that game of Candyland and making it through the track to the end. Um, that's what's important if it's play. If it's winning, and some trophy that is outside of the game itself. You know, you get some reward or you gain some extra prestige in some official way as a result of doing it. And that's why you're doing it instead of just because you want to do it. 
um, then to the degree that that's true, it's not play. So it's self, it's, it's done for its own sake. Another way that, a somewhat fancier way of saying this is that it's intrinsically it's motivated, motivated. That's rather than extrinsically. <laughs> yeah, that's it's, exactly what I was writing as you were talking. it's intrinsically motivated. That's the kind of uh, psychological language for describing it, right? And so it's um, it, it, the the reward is within the the play itself, rather than something outside of the play. So if you're doing it for a gold star, or you're doing it for a trophy, or an A on a report card, or praise from some authority figure, or to improve your resume, <laughs> to the degree that you're doing it for those external kinds of rewards, to that degree, it's not play. Mm -hmm. So one of the, you know, why is this an important characteristic of play? It's important because it is what makes play a safe place. It doesn't matter if you fail. <laughs> it doesn't matter. There's no reward on the line, nor is there any punishment on the line. Nobody's judging you, really. I mean, your your peers might be to some degree, but it's but they're your friends. You know, they're not they're not going to punish you, and that's going to, you know, and and whatever you know, whatever praise they give you today is forgotten tomorrow, and so on and so forth. So. So, so you're so play because play is not for anything immediate that's important and uh, that's being evaluated. It is a place where you're free to try new things that you might not be willing to try in um, so-called real world situation where failure is judged in a negative way. Uh, so in play, you can try things that you might not dare try before. You might try being a different kind of person than who you really are. Just you're like experimenting with being this different kind of person. Or you might try um, some kind of stunt or acrobatic activity that you're not really very good at, but in play because nobody's judging it, you're free to try it. Uh, uh, you might try um, in play, you might try reading even, right? Because it doesn't count, nobody's judging you for it. And in fact, if uh, if you're in a literary environment and there are things to read, children will in play read stuff or pretend to read stuff. Yeah. So that's um, so 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 you are so the fact that it's not being evaluated, the fact that you, it's not in the even in the child's mind, this doesn't count. I'm just doing this because I really want to do this. And in some sense, it's immediately important, but it's important only within the context of play, within the context of the play itself. So, there, you know, there have been, there have been go lots ahead. of times, sorry, there have been lots of times where I've watched, and in particular, right now we have a student who um, would be described by other adults as very shy, very quiet, very observant. But when she is in play, uh, she's the leader. She is the one with the ideas. She is organizing all the other children. She is talking so freely, moving in such a different way. And it's 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 really magical to watch her go from, um, I, I guess, uh, really worried about what others are looking at her or thinking about her until she enters this play space where she has this confidence. And the more that I've watched her play and gain that confidence to make those relationships, the more that I'm seeing her come out of her shell outside of play. So I'm seeing that dynamic really affect who she is as a, as a person outside of those moments. That's a real, that's a really good point that so uh, the, you know, the psychologist, you know, the Russian psychologist Lev Vygotsky, whose writing was in the 1920s and thirties, um, made the point that children children develop abilities in play before they manifest those abilities in the real world and um, and that's a great what you just gave is a great example of that so you're trying things out you're get you're developing the confidence that you can do this you're developing the confidence that, and and that and then you begin to extend that into the real world so even though play takes place in a fictional world, 
it is preparing the child for the for the real world is sort of like a simulation space <laughs> a place to <laughs> a place to try things out to, before you before you put it to the real test <laughs> where people might evaluate you and judge you and you could be embarrassed uh, f f if you uh, don't do it right so uh, so those are the for the th and this kind of leads to the third characteristic of play which is that um, all play has um, an element of imagination to it. Uh, when children are playing, they recognize themselves, even two-year-olds playing, recognize that they are stepping outside of the real world. They're stepping into an imaginary world, a pretend world. You know, in some games, that's obvious. So when children are playing, you know, um, what's called imaginary play or sociodramatic play, you know, they're or make believe play. That's very clear. They're entering, you know, I'm now a king or I'm a troll or I'm uh, I'm a mommy or a baby or whatever it is that I'm playing as we play these roles it's very clear that they're accepting imaginary roles they're creating some kind of a narrative that they're acting out um, and improvising that as they go along um, but is clearly imaginary in other cases it's maybe not quite so obvious but the argument is that um, and i think it's i think it's correct there may be a few exceptions one can find that anything that we would we would likely want to call play, there's a big element of imagination to it. So making a sandcastle on the beach, you taught, you're say I'm making a castle, right? But you know it's kind of a pretend castle. You're not making a real castle. You're making a pretend castle. Uh, you're having a play fight. Uh, it's not a real fight. It's an imaginary fight. It's a pretend fight. It's a play fight. Um, and so on and so forth. You could go right down the list of basically every way you're playing. Even if you're playing a game, let's say you're, let's say you're older kids and you're playing chess, you know, you're, you're, um, now you might say, well, what's imaginative about chess? Well, here's what's imaginative. You are accepting an imaginary world where these pieces can only move in certain ways. This is not the real world. This is an imaginary world. And, but you're accepting that. And you're basically saying, if it's true that bishops can only move on the diagonal, well, what does this mean in terms of the consequences of how I play this game? So what's happening in play is you are always accepting some kind of a imaginary premise, uh, such as I'm a troll, <laughs> or I'm a bishop, or I'm moving my bishop now. And, um, and Given what that premise is, that bishops can only move this way and the trolls always have to act mean and tough, then you have to behave in that kind of way. And so it's practice in, in really the highest order of human thinking, which is hypothetical reasoning. If this is true, then what are the consequences of it? If I'm a troll, then what are the consequences of that for me? But if I'm a troll and you are a billy goat crossing the, you know, crossing over the bridge that I'm under, what are the consequences for you? You have to think about. So we're both thinking in hypothetical terms. This is the way scientists think. And children are practicing that kind of thought when they're engaged in the hypothetical reasoning that goes with play. And I think when they're in that state of imaginary play and they're playing a different role, there's so much perspective taking that has to happen. They have to think about, okay, how must a mom feel if their baby's crying, right? Or how exactly. must a baby behave if they're sad? So there's so much practice in there in understanding other people as they're playing these roles and characters. Absolutely, that's that's absolutely right. So there, you're you're, uh, and that's part of also of the social aspect of play is that you, um, not only do I have to understand who you are as the child who's playing with me, but I also ha have to understand the character you're playing. <laughs> and so there, you know, it's amazing what children can do in play. You know, we we don't credit children with the intelligence that they really have. They. They are, you know, one, another thing Vygotsky once said is that, uh, is that 
we all, especially children, are a head taller in play than we are when we're not playing. We're kind of, you know, we're seeing abilities at their best when children are playing. So imagination is, uh, is the th as I said, the third characteristic of play. A fourth characteristic of play is, and this is the one that kind of surprises most people when I say it, is that all play has rules. And so that's, boy, that's, uh, that doesn't sound right to a lot of people. All play has rules. Um, you know, that sounds like uh, the opposite of play where you have to follow rules. But think about it, play is never random activity. Play always has, maybe a better way to say it is play always has structure. Uh, and people talk about unstructured play, and I always respond, there's no such thing as unstructured play. Play is always structured, and it's structured by the children themselves. The children are either creating the structure, or they are voluntarily accepting the structure that, uh, if they're playing, so, say, a formal game like chess or like Candyland, they're accepting the structure of the game and are choosing to behave within that structure. But play is never random activity. You're, you're, you know, go back to that building a castle on sand castle on the beach. You're not just randomly piling up sand. That really wouldn't be play, unless the rule is we're just being random here. You know, yeah. <laughs> in which case that is part of the structure. Randomness. Anything not random would be violating that rule. So, but the, uh, but normally you're playing. You've got your, your, you're making something. You're not just you know you're or you're building a tower from legos in the playroom or you're or you're acting out a um you're acting out of a play and make-believe imagination where the structure the structure is i i have to behave like the character i am if i'm a mommy here i have to behave the way i believe mommies behave i have to I have to do what mommies would do in this situation. Or if I'm Wonder Woman, I have to act like Wonder Woman. I, if I fall down and scrape my knee, would Wonder Woman cry? <laughs> you know, I, I better hold my tears. Either that or call time out. <laughs> you know, so the uh, so so in some sense, the rules are the other side of the coin of the imagination. You're in this imaginary world where there are certain rules, which may be different from the world, rules in the real world, and you have to, in this imaginary world, follow those rules. So what are children learning here? They are learning to follow rules. They're learning to create rules, to follow rules. They're learning, you know, we think of play as spontaneous and, um, and in that sense as if it were uncontrolled. But, and in one sense, it is spontaneous. Children spontaneously choose to play. They want to choose to play. They don't have to be encouraged to play. They just have to have the opportunity to play. So in that sense, it's spontaneous. But once they're playing, what they've done is they voluntarily put themselves into a situation where they are not completely free. You are now in a situation where there are certain rules that in order to be playing this, you've got to follow. If you are, if you're the mommy in a in a game of house, you've got to behave like a mommy. You can't just behave whimsically the way you might feel like behaving at any given moment. If you're the pet dog, you know, which puts further restraints on you, you've got to walk around on all fours, and you can't talk in words. You can just say "arf arf" and so on and so forth. You have to control yourself and. Um, and so what are children learning when they're in play? They're learning how to control themselves. They're learning how to inhibit their impulses. You know, what, we have this so-called rash of ADHD um, in, our, in our world today. And I think a lot of that is just that normal childhood behavior is being diagnosed as, uh, as hyperactive or uh, inattentive. But it may actually be that because children aren't getting enough play, they're not learning to inhibit their impulses the way children would if they were engaged in the amount of play that children have been engaged in in the past and children in other cultures are engaged in. Um, so if they're always uh, in other, if, if, if they're being deprived of play, they are in some sense being deprived of the opportunity to learn how to both create rules and to follow rules. Follow rules. 
Yeah, and yeah. we're kind of evolving into this more um, like hyperactive being because we're not getting the opportunity to, to, to explore that, to get it out, to use, to, to get those skills of, okay, here's where I have to control that. Here's where I have to follow this right. rule in a play setting. They're just skipping that step. And like exactly. I always say, you can't skip the steps because we're going to see what happens when you do, you know, over time, we're going to see differences in behaviors. We're going to see differences in children's capability if we're not allowing them to have this playtime. Exactly. Exactly. And the rules are enforced, not just by yourself, but by your playmates. So, you know, if you're not following the rules, your playmates will tell you, hey, you've got to, you're the pet dog. You've got to get down on your all fours again. <laughs> you, mm -hmm. You're not allowed to talk and so on and so forth. So you'll be reminded, um, you know, the, one way that I like to illustrate the fact, the idea that play always is an exercise in restraint is to take the take what would seem like, if you're just looking at it superficially, to be the least restrained kind of play. Imagine a couple of boys in a play fight, you know, chasing one another around, swinging sticks at one another, you know, pushing one another down. It looks really wild, right? And so the person looking at that thinks that's really wild behavior. But if you look more closely, or if you put your, if you could put yourself into the head of either of those boys involved in that play fight, you would realize that this is really an exercise in restraint. Mm -hmm. You have to go through the motions of a fight without actually hurting the other person <laughs> because that would ruin the play if you actually hurt the other person. So there are all kinds of implicit rules which are, don't even have to be stated because both boys automatically understand this. And if they didn't, they wouldn't be invited into such play or they would quickly be excluded from it. So no kicking, no biting, no scratching no hitting hard if you're gonna if you're the bigger and stronger of the two you have to self handicap in some way if you push somebody down you have to push them down on something soft like a pillow or a pile of leaves or a snowbank or something where they're not going to hurt themselves so the every move is being is is being governed by certain kinds of rules certain kinds of restraints so the uh, so even in that wild looking kind of play, what children one of the things that children are learning is how to restrain themselves, how to control themselves. And one of the things you talked about earlier was process. And 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 sometimes that type of play with children together learning that it's a process of understanding each other and seeing each other's perspective and learning how hard is too hard for that child and how how soft do I need to be with this child? And I think a lot of times adults get in the way of that. And the children right. don't don't have the opportunity to really go through the process to get to the point where they can have that sort of play safely. And some of the process is, like you said, telling the child who just isn't doing it well without hurting people that they can't play. <laughs> they cannot play this because they're hurting. Somebody. That's right. And that's, that's part right. of those rules that come back in it. I, I, uh, I think uh, as adults, we need to really step back and allow that to happen because right. so much valuable um body awareness and spatial awareness and perspective taking and impulse control is happening during that type of play. So um, right. hopefully we can Exactly. And something that you just said kind of reminded me of another point that I really want to make about play. And that is that the primary freedom in play is freedom to quit. Mm -hmm. If you can't quit, it's not play and it's quitting that really is what and is really is the primary force that makes play cooperative. So if if you and I are playing a game playing together, no matter what it is that we're playing, if I'm playing in some way that is making you unhappy, you can quit. You just quit. You say, I hear my mom calling, I'm going home now. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so that's um that is a key aspect of play because that is the natural consequence of the fact that I've been bullying you. Mm -hmm. And that is the primary lesson to me. That's way more important than if I get a scolding from an adult. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's way more valuable to me because I want to play with you. It's every child wants to play with, uh, with their playmates. I want to play with you, but you, at least for now, you don't want to play with me. You're leaving. <laughs> 
well, that's a lesson. So I'm going to have to think about this a little bit. I'm going to have to realize, well, maybe next time that I play with Lakeisha, I'm going to have to um, have to listen to her a little bit more. <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to uh, control what I'm doing. I'm going to have to compromise. Um, so that power to quit is really, really valuable. It's a, a mistake I think that a lot of teachers make is that to say you have to play with everybody. Well, uh, is that really right? Is that should I should you have to play with me if you really don't want to play with me? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. because I've been I've been kind of a bully or I'm not listening to you or I'm not willing to play in the way that you want to play with. This is also the problem, I think, with so-called play dates. You know, you you don't have a lot of choice of who to play with. It's sort of like an arranged marriage, you know, yeah. and you <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you may not really get along with this person. And you know, in the in the old days, when you just went out in the neighborhood, when I was a kid, and there were all kinds of kids to play with, if if you if you're not happy playing with one kid or a group of kids today you go play with some other kids you know and so uh and that can of course happen in um in a in a uh preschool or you know too where you, you i i think that i think sometimes you hear people you know teachers say you can't tell somebody they can't play with you I think that's a mistake to say I that. Too. I think you I have think. to be able to say, "No, you can't play with me now because you, because I'm playing this and I don't want to I don't want you to play with me right now." That's part of the freedom of of the child to say that. I agree with that. And and yeah. I've watched children who um who had a tough time uh playing in a way that others were comfortable with. And I've watched only the the only thing that was able to get that child to alter the way that they were playing or the way that they were being with others within the group was the fact that the group put their foot down and said, you can't play if you hurt us. It, it didn't matter what the adult said. It didn't right. matter how many tricks that the grownups tried. It wasn't until the children had had enough. Right. That the child altered the way that they were in play. So right. I, I think we're, again, robbing children of the opportunity to use play to its fullest um, when we make rules about who can play, who you have to play with, and um, things of that sort, because we're, we're eliminating that magic part that, that the kids are able to do with their, with their play themselves. Right, exactly, exactly. And it's, it's, you know, whenever we intervene in any way in children's play, we're depriving them of the opportunity to learn how to manage the problems themselves. <laughs> and, um, and that's the whole point of play is for children to learn how to manage, manage themselves without a higher up authority figure. I mean, presumably the whole purpose of childhood is to learn how ultimately to be an adult. But if you're always controlled by adults, you never have the opportunity to be um, managing yourself, being the adult in the situation, <laughs> being the one who decides on the rules, being the one who has to negotiate those rules, being the one who has to figure out how to deal with minor bullying and so on and so forth then you're you're being deprived of the opportunity to develop those adult capabilities and and, and we're you know we've got a generation of young people growing up and in fact a little bit more than a generation young people growing up who are play deprived who are not learning these skills to the degree that they should and we're seeing some of the consequences of that um it's something else that i've written about quite a bit so that's um so, so that's the uh, all right, uh, number four, I believe. So we've gone through number four. The number five is, is sometimes I leave number five out because it's really kind of a consequence of the other of the other four. It's not um, it's not necessarily part of the defining um, characteristics, but it but um, <clears throat> but it is uh, I think worth talking about, and that is that play is an activity that is. Um, is conducted in a um, in a relatively non-stressed but highly alert frame of mind. So you're very much alert. You're very much 
awake, you're very much, you're, you're mentally very active in play. You can't be passive in play because you have to be attending to the rules. You have to be involved in this imagination. You have to be paying attention to your playmates and so on and so forth. So you can't be passive in play. You're always mentally active, but you're not overly stressed in play. And the reason you're not overly stressed, there are a number of reasons why you're not overly stressed. One is this is just pretend. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't do it well. So, and, and you're not being judged. You're not being evaluated by some authority figure. So it's unlike behaving in school where you're constantly in fear that you'll be judged negatively for what you said or what you did. So you're free to, you're free to try things out. And moreover, as I just said, you're always free to quit. So yeah. let's say there's some there's some kinds of play where you're deliberately stressing yourself a little bit, right? It's you're climbing that tree <laughs> as high as you can climb without feeling without feeling terror. But what but, but the reason you dare to climb that tree is you know as soon as it becomes too much for you, as soon as it becomes more frightening than you want to experience, you can come down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, nobody's making you climb that tree. You're just doing it because you want to do it. It's not like, I think one of the worst things that happens in phys ed classes is when the phys ed teacher makes everybody climb a rope to the ceiling. Oh, I don't know yeah, if they still do that. that or not. They do, but they do. I, oh, I think, that's, I think that's cruel. You know, I think that's absolutely cruel. Mm -hmm. That's the worst situation on earth to be doing something that you're a little afraid of or very afraid of or not very good at. You're doing it in front of other people. They're going to be laughing at you or you think they'll be laughing at you even if they aren't, <laughs> you know. This is not... And then you're going to get judged for it. And, get and you're going to get it. judged for it. The time to climb that rope is when you're just messing around and you're just with your friends or you're all alone <laughs> and you're doing it in a playful kind of way. How high can I go in this rope? How high? You don't... That the Doing something that's that's a little bit frightening or even very frightening um you you the last thing you want to do that is in front of other people who might be judging you negatively for it that applies not to just climbing ropes it applies to things like reading i mean the very worst situation for learning how to read is in front of other kids in a classroom you know reading out loud i remember that i was a slow I was reader say, I Yep. So to this day, to this day, I remember the feeling of it almost being my turn to read. Yeah. And no matter oh. if I could do it or not, the stress of it almost right. knocked me out. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I was, I was one of those kids. I might have get gotten some terrible diagnosis if I, if I were in the a kid in the modern world. But I, I was slow at reading. I was one of the late readers. I was always. It was no secret that the reading group I was in was the last, yeah. was the slowest reading group, right? And so you know, and, and I just remember the embarrassment of having to read, especially in front of, especially in front of other people who could read better than me and be, you know, feel like, I don't think they were really ridiculing me. They were a pretty good bunch of kids, but I was afraid they were, you know? And so that's the, uh, that's the, uh, that's the point to be made is that, is that pl if it's play, you're not feeling that kind of terror because you know that nobody's judging you and you know that if it becomes too difficult, you could just quit. Do it when you feel like doing it or don't do it at all, you know? Yeah. So that's uh, that's the other character. Now, one thing we know about this state of being very mentally very alert but not overly stressed is that's the situation that that's the mental state that is best for learning new things and best for thinking uh, um, for solving um, complicated problems not solving the solving what are called insight problems problems that require sort of a jump in imagination where you have to the kind of problem that seems like it's impossible but then mm -hmm. Once you see the solution, the light bulb goes off, right? That's the kind, that kind of problem is best solved when you're in this kind of a playful mental state. Um, it's also the best, it's really the best state for any new learning. Um, you don't want to have a, the stressed mind, you know, what stress does 
is it funnels your it funnels your mind onto tried and true ways of behaving and it prevents you from thinking of new and different ways of behaving so in you know your uh, the example i like to give is you know if you're if you're faced by a real tiger that's not the time to experiment with new ways of dealing with a tiger. <laughs> that's the time to do with whatever it is that's what most, you know, work. You know <laughs> gonna work. But if you are pre, if you are playing a game where you're being attacked by a pretend tiger, <laughs> now that's a good time to practice. Think about different ways of of dealing with the tiger. So the uh, so you're open. The mind is open to new ways of doing things and trying new ways of doing things. And um, and many, you know, the the real problems in life always require. It wouldn't be a problem if you could just use your own true tried and true way of solving it. Then it wouldn't be a problem. You would just okay. This is, you know, there's snow on my driveway yesterday morning I went out and shoveled it <laughs> you know that's the uh, that's the tried and true way of solving it no creativity required but if uh, this were a different kind of situation where it's not a tried and true thing and and there's a problem created um, I would like, like I would need to not change. be very stressed about it in order to figure out how to solve it yeah. awesome well Peter Dr. Peter Gray, this has been a fascinating talk with you. And I always love to um, have the talk where we define what we're just saying, right? Because there are people outside of our field who may use, like you said at the beginning, a word in a different way than what we're using it. So if we're clear about what we mean, then we're all speaking the same language. So thank you so much for clearly stating what play is in the context that we're talking about. Can you please tell us how people can contact you and read some more of this wonderful work? Okay. Well, um, you can, uh, as I mentioned at the outset that I, I write a regular blog for Psychology Today. You can find that, just Google Peter Gray Psychology Today. And um, I also, on any of my blog posts, you will also near the bottom see a link to my Facebook page. And so you can uh, see my posts on Facebook. That's another way to contact me. You could message me on Facebook as, a, as another possibility. So those are um, some ways to keep in touch with my work or to and to communicate with me if you find a desire to do so. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time and all of your wonderful work. Thank you, Lakeisha, and thank you for your wonderful work. And that was another episode of the Defending the Early Years podcast. Defending the Early Years works to support the rights and needs of young children nationally. Learn more at DEY.org. Pay us a visit, sign up for our newsletter, or connect with us on social media. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.